I figured we'd start today and we'd talk about how to spot a good lead, a team lead or a tech lead. I used to be a QA lead uh, in my career for, for quite a bit, for about five years, actually, I was a QA team lead. So uh, this is a topic I had a bit, a bit of experience about. And then when I was a consultant for a bit of a time, I worked with a lot of leads. Some were good and some were not so good. So the caption on this podcast might be how to spot a good, but it, it also might be how to spot a terrible lead. <laughs> I'll yeah. have to think about it. Well, <laughs> I think if you if you think about it even just a little bit, it's so much easier to spot a bad lead than it is to spot a good lead because with a good lead, things just work. And yeah. when things work, one tends not to question that, right? right. Things are going fine. Well, why are they going fine? It doesn't matter. They're going fine. So yeah. we don't have to introspect on it. Well, so yeah, it, it's, it's much easier to spot a bad lead. But what makes a good lead? So I think what we need to do is really think about the word lead. It, it's, it's one of those things that appears in a title, but it, it's obviously also a verb. So when you're, when you're leading, as opposed to what's in your title, because I really don't care about titles, mm-hmm. what does that mean? What does that actually mean day in, day out, yeah, that yeah. you're a lead? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fair question. So I, I will tell you what it was like in my situation. So in my situation, it meant that it, this was like a medium-sized company that I was a team lead in. And it would be much different. <clears throat> if you were a team lead at a, a very, very, very large organization, the, the, the role of team lead, you might might encompass 100 employees. It might, it might be a, more like a program lead, quite honestly. But but in my experience, I was a team lead. My team was like eight people, something like that. And it was a QA team, right? And what I would do is, as the lead, I had all the responsibilities that any of the QA analysts would have uh, at, at that point in time, which meant that I would work on projects or I would run down issues or bugs or whatever as they crop up, investigate. So anything a normal QA person would do, but I also could be delegated pieces of the manager's job. So I would take a first pass at writing reviews. I would uh, take, I'd, I'd be the first level of interviewing most of the time. And I would coach team members when they needed to be coached, you know what I mean, to either help them learn a skill or improve certain things. And Usually if I got delegated, my, my manager was pretty interactive, so he, he, he wasn't like he was stepping away, but I could be, I could be called on to represent the department in, in meetings where it's like a managerial level meeting. I could step in if needed. I didn't do it all the time. I, I could definitely see if the company was much, like the company was like thousands of employees and the QA department was 100 people split across however many teams. Right. I, I probably would have done nothing but engage at a managerial program level to bounce back and forth, but that's what I did. You know, it was it was kind of if I bounced into projects, I almost never worked on projects solo. That was just me by myself. If I did, it would have been because like they were trying to assemble the A crew to really make a yeah. project super successful with you know just the top people. Uh, but it wouldn't have been a project that the team was sticking together. It would have been some kind of special initiative, get together, knock something out, go on to the next thing. Yeah, so let me ask you this then. So in addition to your responsibilities as a lead, did you have any additional asks from the organization that you were also accountable for? A normal QA person would just be assigned to one project or team, and then they wouldn't bounce from team to team to team. I would pretty much exclusively bounce from team to team to team. And all the rest of this stuff is outside of one team's per The interviewing and the training, all that stuff is outside of... Like if you think about a budget of one team, it's outside of the purview of one team. So I like as a lead, all I did was firefight all day long and, and go where it looks like something was falling behind or something was falling apart or whatever. And that's pr- pretty much it. It's hard to write a job description of exactly what I did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's where I was going really. So, you know, what I wanted to kind of tease out is the fact that sometimes as a lead, you have other responsibilities, meaning if you're a QA lead, you uh, still have to perform QA tasks. Mm-hmm. And over and above that, you're a lead. So you have to, like you said, you know, hire, you have to interview, right. Right. you have to train, etc. Right. And 
even beyond that, right? So you have to be present in these meetings with the stakeholders or the business for you know, refinements, pre-refinements, whatever it is that, you, that all these different meetings um, that you're, you're called upon to, yeah. to attend. Yeah. So I wanted to see if you found that as something that was um, readily kind of doable or was it a bit of a stretch as a lead? Because a lead, what I've seen a lead do often is do everything a QA person's doing, which mm -hmm. is already a full-time job. Right. And then over and above that, you know, layered on top of that, there's A, B, C, D. Yeah, that, that, I would say that that's true. Yeah, that's, that's true. In my experience, that that was true as well. I mean, the the, the thing that was nice about well, maybe it's my personality. I really, I really honestly don't know. The thing that was nice is uh, like I, for example, what you're talking about. There was one specific product at the time where uh, I was the expert at that product. When the developer wanted to know if the product could do something or where in the product to go, you know, they would come and ask me. You know, when someone from the business would get a call from support or somebody from sales is trying to sell something they're not sure about a capability of product, they would mm -hmm. come get me. So not only was I the technical expert of the product, I was also the, the domain you know expert of the product as well. So, and that product wouldn't get changed a lot because it was an older product, but it was at the core of the software for what we used. And like an, an example of if a project was going on that was going to be changing that software and they were doing refinement, they would usually come get me to sit in the refinement to listen to the proposed changes, but I wouldn't be involved in the testing, and I wouldn't be involved in the day-to-day -day of the of the sprint that was going on making those changes. I wouldn't be in there every day. Sometimes I'd, I'd, I'd drop in if they say, hey, we're demoing the feature, we want you to, to be in there to look at it. I, I would drop in and, and, and look at it. Yeah, so did you find that taxing on your time? No, because I, had, I don't have a, because the QA team members that I had take over that domain for me I trusted them. So, so you, you had lieutenants that actually you, yeah. backed you up. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. I think that's critical. That's where yeah. I was going. As a lead, one of the fundamental elements of success is to have people that back you up, right? right. Your, right. your own team, for instance. Yeah. They will come through and do things that they need to do. And so you're not needed 100% of your time or even anywhere close to that because you can't possibly be yeah. fulfilling your role as well, a lead otherwise. I mean, I easily could have seen a situation where like, uh, that, that, that's, that's, that's what you're talking about right now is uh, two-sided because on one hand, the, the person who I'm delegating the responsibility of that product for now, who's on the team that maintains that product now, I, I have to know that they're capable of doing what I, the tasks that I gave them, I, did, I assigned them that team basically. But on the same side, like they have to trust that I'm not gonna micromanage them. Yes. I don't know if you can get one without the other. If I could have trusted that person, I, I, don't even, I don't even know a good way to explain this. That person can trust that I'm behind them and believe in their ability to do it and then also micromanage them. They would never get that belief that I have trust in them to do it, and so they never gain that confidence. I don't know how to explain what I f am feeling right now. No, but I, I certainly understand what you're saying because that's one of the things I wanted to kind of explore as well is one of the, the I think one of the success factors as a lead is to elicit that trust among your team. So to know that they have your back, right, basically. And so you can't be everywhere, first of all, right? right. And secondly, any you, you good- need, You need to know that you can't be everywhere. Exactly, yeah, yeah you need to have that self-awareness. But any good team lead worth their salt understands this, mm -hmm. that when they're not there, they need somebody to pitch in for them, right? right. So it could be anything. You could be off sick, you could be on vacation, whatever. Now the lead is not there, mm -hmm. right? They're gone. What happens now? Does everything just you know screech to a halt? Ideally, no, because your team will say, we've got this, right? Because you know you trust them, they know you trust them, mm -hmm. and whatever actions they take in good faith, you will back them on it. Yeah. So coming back full circle is, as a team lead, one of the things you have to do is trust your people. Right, right. Trust that they will do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. I think what I was trying to say earlier is, I, as the lead, had to take the first step in that, in that I have to be able to trust, but then you have to earn the trust and you have to prove that you're trustworthy and that kind of, but in that standoff, somebody has to make the first move. So I, I as the lead, 
should be the one I have like I, cause I have more seniority than everyone else I have more experience than everyone else you know I'm in the position of lead so theoretically I'm a representative of leadership even if it's only a delegated representative of leadership I should be the one taking the the leader well, call let's call it leadership I'm the one that should be taking the leadership step of I'm going to trust you and 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 I'm going to be looking to verify you know, that, that my trust is not misplaced later through whatever, I don't know, through number of bugs, through how happy the customer is, through how happy the PO is with the person that I put on the team, how happy the developer is mm -hmm. to work with the person. I, Cause that team was only, it was a 1.5 developers, complicated, Don't I'm not gonna get into it. 1.5 developers and one QA person. So, so you're going where, I, you know. Real so tight, it was a real tight relationship, you know. But even our last team, so I think, I think where you're going is as a lead, with your teams, you trust but verify. To kind yeah. of use that yeah. over yeah, overused yeah. cliche, right? Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. You have to trust them. Mm -hmm. But then the flip side of that, as a team member looking at you, Lee, you must feel that you, as a team member, are empowered by your lead, mm -hmm. right? Because oftentimes you're you're basically pinch hitting. You you're brought yeah. in, right? Yeah. Because the you know the lead can't be everywhere. Yeah. So in that case, what do you do? So if you're actually empowering them, that's a great sign, I think. But you can't empower people willy nilly. Like you can't say everybody's empowered to do anything. That that yeah, just that, is like that's, that's, anarchy. When I when I hear <laughs> when I hear that, I typically expect that whoever's telling me that is a bad actor in the organization, and they actually are a micromanager. Like, oh, everybody's empowered. Raise, the, <laughs> stop the line if you see a problem. But the minute you you pull that chain and stop the line, you get yeah. Oh, what are you doing? You're delaying us. Blah blah. blah. Why would you do that? And then you know, turns out if it's something that's you know something yeah. that was trivial or something that you could have fixed or whatever you <laughs> never hear the end of it and i remember I, I had a manager one time i was on a vacation when there was like a refinement or something i can't remember what it was like i think it was like the end of a sprint event like a planning or something and i wasn't there because i was on vacation and for years he was like you're never at plannings i'm like i missed one planning in x years and you will never let it go that was his thing. You're never at planning events because I missed one ever ever since I missed that one. But it's like, yeah, man, like steer away from people like that. I can't let people look at the other thing is like, OK, so the, the mirror of this is in that instance, I, I just was the first person. I was like, I'm going to trust that they're going to do it. And I'll kind of quietly watch the stats on the back end and talk to people one on one on the back end, deploying those leadership skills to, to, to figure out how my people are doing. So there's a way to measure and evaluate somewhat someone on your team where it doesn't feel so you know over the top or I, yeah you know, i think you're going where you're not hiding it but i mean right so as a leader as a lead mm -hmm. right, i'll drop the er as a lead one of the things that you i think that you just touched on that you've got to be able to measure right you yeah. can't just say everyone can do everything you've got to be able to say okay within reason right Right. You can do things, but then you look back, you step back and say, okay, let's see how they did and why they did what they did mm -hmm. uh, and evaluate that. I think that's fair, right? And and the important thing you just said there is provide feedback. I think I heard that or, or maybe, I, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because we, you didn't, I'm reading between the lines, wide lines. Yeah, you, you have to do that though because otherwise your people aren't going to feel empowered, first of all. And secondly, they will not pitch it for you. What you'll see is silence and non-committal, non-participatory non kind of responses, right? And you're not there, but they're your folks, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's just going to backfire on you. So yeah. I think it, it, it's, a, it's a symbiotic, big word. It's a two-way relationship, yeah, yeah. right? In that way, because if you give them a bit of rope to work with and then kind of make sure that they hear from you why they did whatever they did is right it's appreciated by you or not so much but you know suggest corrective actions whatever it is right mm -hmm. for them to improve upon i think that's the mix that you need yeah. i believe that's the mix that you need yeah. i've seen that i've seen that play out as a as in the environment where you had a tech lead and and like and like your situation, they were over multiple people. I want to say about eight people mm -hmm. on two teams. And some of those team members were flex team members, in quotes, flex. They went from one team to the other on a need basis. Ugh. 
I know. So it's it's hard because you have to provide feedback on what they did, and then the next situation they're in is uh, not yeah. a similar situation. How, how are you ever going to know? Yeah, when yeah. Jump from team. It, it, it has its like, own challenges. Like but that, that was that was that was always a challenge for me about being a team lead, and not to stray too far from the subject. But the, the challenge for me was was if your job role requires you to jump from team to team and operate in team mode and then operate in individual mode and kind of operate between the seams for a while. Like it's real hard to keep any kind of metric based on what you're doing to back up pretty much anything. I mean, it becomes real difficult to evaluate your, your performance when you kind of live b between all of the lines in the organization. I, I do remember that being a difficult, there was a lot of difficult conversations uh, back and forth with my manager especially regarding performance, because I was like, how are you even going to track how well I'm doing? Because every way you would track how well I'm doing, you also would track how well the manager is doing. Because I'm a direct reflection on, you know, and vice versa. The managers can affect my job in the same way. However, I'd say this. So, yes, you're right. But with a lowercase p here, right? So I think it's evidence-based, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I think if you're a lead, you could say, to your team member, this is what happened, here's what should have happened, etc. Yep. But the team member really isn't empowered or isn't, that's not the right word, maybe they don't feel safe saying, but what happened only happened because I only had so much to work with, right? right? I needed more training, etc., cetera, et cetera. Right. Then what happens next? Like, does that come back on you as a team lead, or does it? Like, what happened? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this is this is the problem with having a team lead is is and really having anything. Like, again, I was in a I was in a. You're gonna laugh at this one because we were just talking about this one. I, I was in an organization once where you had permanent employees and you had contractors, and any problem that the the team group department whatever had, it was like you could just blame it on a contractor, and then they just fire the contractor. And then suddenly nobody had to take responsibility for it. But none of the problems went away. They, the pro all the problems stayed with the group, regardless of how many temporary employees they got rid of. This is the same thing. I mean, it's hard to stick anything to a team lead because it's, it's too easy to say it's either the, the individual employee who was directed to do something, it's, it was their uh, mistake problem, or it was the manager who didn't correct it in time even though the team lead spotted it. So it's like the team lead kind of has a really, I, I will tell you, the team lead role was a really sweet role because if if done correctly, almost nothing sticks to a team lead. Right. So <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned that example, you know, where contractors are expendable, right? It's interesting because team leads typically, in my experience at least, have been FTEs. And to your point, if things go wrong, it's always, it's, his or her fault yeah and so we get the next person in but that doesn't move you forward really your problem doesn't go away as an organization all that happens is names change mm -hmm. so as i like to say the heads in the guillotine change yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's a bit morose but i've seen that actually play out as a team lead though one of your i'm gonna try and i'm gonna try and kind of suggest this and you, you know feel free to just say no, you're on a different planet. <laughs> it's fine. I'm okay with that. As a team lead, regardless of whether you're an FTE or contract or whatever, I think it's almost your professional responsibility to say you are a team lead. Look at those words, literally. Yeah. It doesn't matter if your team has contractors or not, mm -hmm. and lead them. But also at the same time, if you feel pressure, as I've seen happen right, on yeah. team leads because they, they have to do their regular job right. on top of right. being a lead. Right. If you feel that, call it out and step down from the lead situation if you excel in a team role. Mm -hmm. Or say, I cannot perform as a team member as well as a team lead. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna direct more of the team members to do what needs to be done, but don't expect the same throughput from me, right? Uh, yeah. Have that. Yeah. Have the guts to say that. I would say that when I moved into consulting, that was pretty apparent to me that there were some people who came up through the teams who haven't figured out uh, how to delegate because as, a, as a, the, the I never had a problem when I was a team lead of divesting myself of my quote day-to-day -day job like you just said so I think if you do that 
the organization needs to now take a stance on that and say, you know, how do you measure a team lead? Uh, I guess I wanted to go there next. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. How, how does yeah. a team lead get evaluated, mm-hmm. right? And I've seen two different things here. Um, and I'm sure there are a bunch more in between. It's just my limited experience. But what I've seen is this. A team lead is evaluated by an organization that really doesn't understand what a team lead is. They simply bestow a title upon someone and they evaluate a person using the same rubric they use as a team member. I've seen that. The other thing I've seen is the other, I don't want to say the other end of the spectrum because I think the spectrum is quite wide, but the other thing I've seen is organizations that say, if you're a lead, we expect you to develop people right Mm -hmm. so you're evaluated based on those kinds of skills Mm -hmm. and and we can we can definitely dive into that but maybe that's a different different topic for a different podcast but yeah you're actually evaluated on your ability and your capability to develop people not produce things on the team level right yeah so i've seen both i don't know what your thoughts are on that i i I can tell you i was evaluated on both at the same time which is terrible (laughs) (laughs) i'm pretty sure i got my worst evaluations when i was a team lead like i ruffled the most feathers when i was a team lead because because again i have to represent management in in some instances and then i have to represent the the workers you know in, in other instances so i'm stuck between like i always tell people being a team lead is basically being a middle manager being a middle manager is the worst position in the organization because you can't ignore the people that are below you. They have nowhere else to go. You can't ignore them. You have to help them get over whatever hurdle they're on. And you can't ignore management because they, they're not going to, you don't want them going directly to your team member. So you, they have to go through you. And a lot of managers, when I talk about identifying managers that are uh, like, not great managers. This is one. This is one of the other things I talk about. Here's here's a real example of something that will happen, right? So somebody is not happy. Somebody's not happy with the performance of somebody in, in QA on the team. Hey, this person. I, I think this person is uh, not not pulling enough hours or producing buggy work or something like that, or you know, not catching bugs soon enough. I'll say, well, let's let's look at the metrics together. Let's meet one on one, you know, in an office or something like that, in a meeting room or something like that, and uh, let's look at the metrics and and figure out if what you're telling me is just what you feel, because maybe they're a senior developer or something on the team, or maybe they're tired of their developers complaining at them or something. And we'll look at the metrics, and the metrics don't back up what they're saying. You know, this person doesn't write any more bugs. The 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 the, the bugs for this product line haven't haven't went up or down since this person was on the team. You know what I mean? I don't see any patterns uh, according to the data. Well, I, I still feel this way. I want this person. I want to trade him out for another person, but I still feel that way. And I would say, well, the metrics don't support what you're saying. I'm not going to trade the person out until something else occurs. There's, there's a reason. Now, until there's a reason to change person. Now, now here's, here's where we get into where I was talking about, like how to spot a good bet. Like I would already know. That person would go to that person would go to their manager. Their manager would go to my manager. My manager would come down and say, "Look, just trade the person out on the team. I I don't I don't want to I don't want to deal with all this complaining. Just trade the person out." Right. And, that that you know, is the most common um, behavior out there. And, and to your point, the problem doesn't go away. It's, it's I'm like, what's going to happen the next time they want the person traded out? Because they're not because they're maybe the you know. Maybe they're very right to have that. Maybe the person that's on the team is asking the right questions. Yeah. Maybe they just don't like answering questions. Maybe the, the real problem is one of the developers on the team. Maybe the real problem is a PO on the team. You know? Yeah, so are they crying wolf, right? That, right. So, yeah, I, I agree with so that. So it's like my, my, not, me not being backed up in, in that. I remember a bunch of examples like that where it's just somebody makes such a fuss. In the, it's not, and this is not even something bad on my particular manager. It's just they are choosing. They don't want to fight that fight for whatever reason with that particular actor inside the organization. And they just say, look, just do this just one time and you know, make it go away. Th- those were the worst situations for me. And it's like the, they say, pick your battles, right? Yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. I would always fight it out. I'd be like, sure. oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> pick your battles, but pick every one of them. Yeah. No, so I think there's an element of politics there as well, but we won't, we're not, right. we won't go there. So right. the thing I wanted to say is this. Sometimes what happens is, in, like in your example, you could push back and say the data, and I love the fact that you know mm. your approach was data driven. The data doesn't support your decision, right, Mr. X, Miss Y, whatever. Yeah. The data doesn't support that. So I like that. However, I have come across some situations where you don't have 
that hire and fire authority anyway. Right. And someone makes the decision, they're not consulting with you to make the decision. Right. They're simply telling you the decision has been made. Yeah. So Brian, so-and-so is off your project now. Yeah. Please welcome somebody else, yeah. right? And that's when you go, but why? And they're like, just do it, yeah. right? Just just Nike it for oh, me. Oh. It's like, I will, I will tell you that's that is the only I wasn't there I was a manager I wasn't a team lead when this happened but that was the that was the, one of one of the, I can count on one hand the number of times I have become highly emotional in a workplace and that was that was one of the times I became highly emotional in the workplace was that I got a call from I don't remember who I got a call from I think I got a call from HR and they're like this person on your team's last day is today and Yikes. I was like what are you talking about? This person's on contract. I think we had like three month rolling contracts for, for we had we had uh, software testers, which are like people just, just getting their start in the, in the field, you know, people that would hire like straight out of college or whatever. We paid them pretty well. I don't remember what the pay rate was, but the idea is they were on three month rolling contracts and I would renew. If they were good after the three months, I'd renew them for another three months and, and so on and so forth. Because at that point we were transitioned from manual shop to a automation shop and I needed engineers full-time automating things that were never automated before but right. i needed the analysts doing the things that they were, the, i basically i had to split my budget between automating things and my analysts and i couldn't afford more analysts so the idea was i could hire a tester like an entry-level tester for basically half of what an analyst costs so i was like well if i can't hire you know three more analysts like i need to run the department yeah. I'll, I'll hire two three four i don't i think i had three at the at the i can't remember i was like oh I'll, I'll hire a bunch of testers and uh, yeah the hr called and they're like we're taking away budget from your department and uh, you got to cut this person today i was like how are you going to make that decision and not even talk to me i actually was a manager of the department at that point no and and the company had been the company had uh, there's some backstory here that i'm not giving to you but the i don't know how we got on this topic well we're here <laughs> purchased Bef like a while before this and I, I had a budget with which to run the department and once the company was purchased they took the budget away from me and moved it up to like I don't remember VP level or C level I don't remember what they did but basically I just got a call from HR and it was like yeah this person's last days today They're, you got no more money we're taking it away it's been moved to another you know it's basically been moved somewhere else <sighs> and I, I clearly remember what I did after like I got super emotional and I, I tried to fight it but it was pretty clear the session was already made. I, I think my boss is out. I think I called my boss. He was out of town. I can't remember. I think he just didn't respond, I, I think, which is typical uh, of our relationship at that point in time. <laughs> you know, when he, you know, he already greenlit a decision, didn't tell me about it. And yeah, I had to, had to tell him I had no hand in this. I don't know if he believed me or not. You know, I, I, and honestly, if somebody told me that, I don't know if I would believe him or not either. It was exactly. Tough yeah. conversation. I, yeah, I remember as soon as he left, he left at like Three thirty, four o'clock, something like that. And I remember as soon as he left, I cleared all my stuff out of my desk that like was not like company property because I was like, I might just walk out, man. I might just call him and be like, and you guys, I'm on vacation, and when you want to call me and explain to me why I was left out of this, you can call me. And if you don't want to call me, I'm not coming back. I was that serious about about you know being what I what I had seen as disrespected, basically. But that, I wasn't a lead at that point. I was a manager at that point. So it was a little bit different. I don't know many leads that deal with the actual budgeting of their, you know. There are very few, in my experience at least. They're really simply more experienced team members that also have an inclination to kind of help others. Because I, yeah. I've come across some really expert team members, right? right but right. they will not make good team members because they, they just like to work solo. Yeah. And that's great. You yeah. Leave them alone. Yeah. You know, let, let them be in their corner and, and churn out good stuff. Yeah. But, that, but then, you know, a, a team lead has to be able to communicate, has to be able to nurture others, etc. Yeah. So all of those things. But I want to just go back a little bit, um, if I can, right, to the point where decisions are made without the, the team lead's involvement, yeah. right? I, so I'm just reflecting back on that since you said that uh, just a minute or two ago. I don't think I've ever come across a situation where the team lead was heard before a decision was made. Like, in other words, decisions were made above them and yeah. handed down, right, yeah. for them to just either execute upon or just you know, after the fact, mm -hmm. like so-and-so is not there anymore on your team as opposed to, you know, 
make yeah. sure so and so is not yeah. there on your team do the dirty deed but no they somebody's done that for you so you show up to work one day or you open your inbox and you oh i don't have a team member anymore yeah. and now your your mind starts to reel and you oh, why is that yeah and it goes anywhere from ah oh, well what did that person do to deserve the fate that right. they receive right. and it goes quickly from there to oh what could i have done is this going to reflect on me yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. so that's i think that's typically how a lead would feel i've i've not felt that yeah. you know as a lead as a as a program manager and i had project managers but it was more of a dotted line pmo situation etc mm -hmm. etc wasn't like a a small team delivering with a team lead that can help steer and give direction it's mm -hmm. it wasn't like that at all yeah I, like um, i would say you want a team lead that you work for to have integrity to be honest with you about what they cuz cuz like on some level they are a worker you know what i mean mm -hmm. they're not management e even though they may de be delegated some level of responsibility in management they're not really management they're not even junior man well, i mean they're junior man. They're arguable they're, arguable if they're but they're, they're largely technical in, yeah in they're, nature. they're yeah they're really yeah they're yeah they really are they're 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 part of the technical staff but they wouldn't have gone through necessarily right any leadership so, training for so instance y you no i am and, and actually i think most of them do not go through mm -hmm. any kind of leadership training, which is probably why there's so many problems out there yeah. but the the integrity slash honesty component I think is critical because in, in, in the instance that I brought up where that, that somebody got let go and nobody ever considered, nobody ever talked to me or whatever, like I have to pass that through to my team, I, which I did. I had to pass that through to my team lead. I had to go to my team lead. I actually went to, I just, like the whole team worked in an area. So I just told all the team at once. I was like, hey, we let this person go today. I got a call. This is exactly how it happened. And I had to be as transparent about it as possible. Obviously, I wouldn't want, I, I would have rather told them at the beginning of the week sure. that this is this person's last week and we could have figured out you know whatever rather than like 10 minutes before they were going to tell him they told me but the if the team lead does not have integrity and cannot be honest whatever tries to hide things or whatever that damages that damages the trust right but i would i would point out as well i don't know if it's more damaging equally damaging damaging in a different type of way i don't know where people obviously see that the management to the team lead, there is not integrity there. Because then you start now, because uh, the I think that's even more dangerous because now the team lead and the whole team that works for that team from the management are viewed as like, their loyalties in question, you know what I mean? They're gonna be, keep that whole department group, whatever you wanna call it, they may cut that whole group. Yeah, that, that feeling precipitates pretty quickly. You know, when you start seeing or not even seeing, I guess, but you know, you can keep your pulse on the on the comms and see if there's any rumblings around that. Mm -hmm. People start looking at job boards. I mean, you know, there's the trust is gone. Yeah, and yeah. it takes so long to earn the trust, yeah. but it takes so little to use to lose it. Uh, and that's yeah. that's the thing that I wanted to kind of bring out as a team lead. One of your, I wouldn't say duties or responsibilities. But one of the things you you should be doing innately, I guess, is to really go to bat for your team, mm -hmm. right? And so if that sometimes means having that awkward conversation with your leadership, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, technical or business or whatever, that's what you need to be able to stand up and say, right? It, I don't believe this yeah. is the right thing to do. Yeah. Here's why. And when you do that, don't just have that conversation, but be ready to go in with an alternate solution maybe too and you say what you're trying to do i see what you're trying to do but tactically that's not the right thing to do yeah yeah please explain to me what is the strategic outcome you hope to get out of this but here are a couple of things that i might suggest mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so now you look at the your leadership and see if they're amenable to or receptive to those ideas if they are that speaks volumes about them mm -hmm. if they're not they just shut you down and they say do as i say that again speaks volumes. Yeah. Different different tone, but yeah, yeah. it speaks volumes I, again, I, right? I can tell you about a program. An example of that is when the, the, the team lead started being seen as not able to deliver. And the way the management came down on him was they just they fired his whole team and took the team offshore and tr tried to make him now delivering with an offshore team. And then once I heard that, I was like, you are done. You are done, <laughs> sir. Like, you're never going to deliver with an offshore team because they – 
You couldn't deliver on the onshore team. What makes you think you do the same? So now that we're talking about bad behaviors, I'll launch into an entire segue on bad behaviors because I want to go down my list of bad behaviors. In the example I used before of the example where I was on vacation for one sprint planning, so he was like, oh, you're never reliable at sprint plannings, and you, you're you never at the sprint plannings when they happen because I miss, I literally missed one. That was his behavior. He was engaged in punishing behavior. That was just a flaw of his personality. Yeah, okay. it's that blame mentality. It, it was just a flaw of his... Per- yeah, he was the first guy that when something happened, he would finger point. And, and anybody anybody who would offer contrary evidence or like numbers, like oh, I was talking about before with numbers, like he would say, oh, now you're just finger pointing. He would basically... It, it was accuse somebody of the behavior that you're doing before. You know what I mean? If you can level the first accusation, you can win. Like he had a lot of behaviors like that. He had... Like, he would have a very punishing behavior and a few character defects, basically character flaws. And and good management should be vetting out the people with these deep character flaws and kind of telling them, look, you either need to, you either need to, you know, the, the funny thing about working with that guy is I felt because I was exposed to somebody who was just like a cartoon version of somebody who normally might have these behaviors, I tried to cut those out of my own behavior when I saw them. You know, so I, after working with that person, I became more of like a, let me say it once and then just let it go. You know what I mean? I'll I'll bring it up once. If you miss a meeting once, I'll bring it up once to you and then, and then let go of it. Cause nobody wants to be around, like forget work for a second. Nobody wants to be around a person who always brings up the same failure or the same time you disappointed them or the same time, whatever, where they felt, you know, whatever over and over and over the same the same disagreement over and over and over again you don't want to be around someone like that and like that was a huge character flaw of that person you probably should have never been in a lead position i absolutely agree I, th- I think often things like that are basically covering up for your own deficiencies yeah, yeah. you know it's deflection right i know what you're doing and oh wait i have that too but that time when you did it 14 years ago, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, yeah, I exaggerate, but not much. Yeah. So yeah, that's very typical. But when when a red flare goes up for me is, if a team member does that, and you kind of have that conversation with yeah. them, whether yeah. it's one-on-one or whatever, and you say, okay, well, I'm hoping that they understand, and the next time it happens again. Mm-hmm. So when it keeps repeating, it's like, okay, they're beyond help. Yeah. You know, as a team lead yourself, you can look for that. But as a team member and your team lead is doing that, that is bordering on a toxic environment because yeah, yeah. their leadership, which is also your leadership, right? They're not gonna listen to you. They put yeah, that person no. and entrusted them in that role and they're yeah. gonna say, oh, you're just complaining, right? Yeah, so yeah. It'll, it'll immediately reflect back on you because they'll say, well, it's not him or her, it must be you because you're complaining yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and so yeah. th- you have to tread carefully. I think you started off by saying, you know, like pick your battles. I think in this case, that is a battle that is not winnable. I, you know, I, sometimes you have, you come yeah. across battles that are not winnable, right? And I, you just say, well, this one I'm not fighting. I tend to agree. When I was a consultant, I worked with a guy one time that I, I was pretty certain was an alcoholic because alcoholics have highs and lows. They have highs when they're in really, really great moods and they have lows when they're just like everything. They're just in a terrible mood. Nothing ever goes right. They, they seek out the bad in every situation. I mean, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't really know, but I tend to have an eye for this kind of thing. <laughs> I might cut that out. <laughs> but uh, I don't exactly know what his situation was. But uh, as a consultant, uh, I, I communicated back with my company. I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure I know what's going on with this guy. I'm going to start taking documentation about like times when he shows up, when he's in these moods. You know, times what he says, what, like key, if I can remember key phrases or write down key phrases that he says, because he would, he would engage in some very seriously punishing behavior. Not to, not just to me. I mean, yeah, I was a consultant and a little more senior than most of the other people that were on the team at the time. But some of, some of the more junior employees that were on his team, he, whew, it was very bad stuff that I observed. But again, I was just consultant in that environment. I wasn't a permanent employee. So if I were to go to HR or whatever, they very well may have just cut me from the team to make the problem go away. Because at, at, at that point, the person reporting the problem is the only nail sticking out. But even, I, even like I told, I told my firm at the time, I was like, there's no way this dude's file in HR is squeaky clean. I was like, there's gotta be. Like if he's this far down the road, 
there's got to be uh, 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 some stuff in, in this. Fight. But I, listen, I'm 100 percent with you on that uh, on that one. Do you really want to walk down this road of trying to like make organizational change against the trend of you know? What I mean, like, I, yeah. It, uh, honestly, it's, it's a lot easier just to stand up for yourself and just be prepared to walk. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I think in those situations, you find yourself like Sisyphus, you know, trying to push that rock up a hill, right? Yeah. And you're the only one, and the rock's like 18 times bigger than you, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's an astute person who recognizes in the moment that this is not a battle that I'm going to win. Yeah. So I'm going to yeah. walk from this. And there's nothing I, wrong with I, that. I mean, I don't think there's anything. I, like, I know I, just because of my personality, I would try to walk down the road of fixing it and be prepared to get walked out. And any, and you know what I mean? But like, there, there's some people, they're not mentally prepared nor willing to be fired over something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I almost, well, I'm a little bit weird, I guess. I almost considered that as a badge of honor to say I did the right thing. Yeah. That, you know, it just wasn't going to work. Well, a lot, right? of, a lot of people don't see it that way, though, because they, I get lot, it. I think I get that it. the HR thing that I've seen is past behavior is the best indicator of future, future performance. Performance, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. So if they see you getting fired, that they're not going to, they're going to immediately assume that, you know, oh, well, the, between what you say and what the other person say is the truth, you know, they're going to assume that, right? So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying, like, that, that's that's yeah. the reality that you have to judge the situation. So so the, the punishing behavior is one. That's probably the most obvious thing that's on this list is punishing behavior. The other thing I've seen that's on this list that is fairly obvious that I have a story for that was not obvious to me at the time was the hero I call him the hero developer, but it could be you could be applied to any team lead. The the hero team lead. So here is my story about the hero team lead. Basically, the, the real short version of the hero developer is whenever they have a problem, problem in production or a, a deadline that's about to be missed or whatever, the hero developer jumps in. He works nights. He works weekends. He gets a team to work nights and weekends with him. Oh, we got to have this done. Oh, I know it's Friday at 630, but we we got to have this whatever in. We got to have this fix in, and it's got to get committed and pushed out and tested and run through all the normal bureaucracy, but somehow in a hurry, even though it's already well after hours and it's Friday, so we, should, we shouldn't be taking the risk. Kind of pushes it and makes, you know, against all, against all deadlines and all whatever it goes out and is successful and when you burn the team when you burn that candle at both ends and and make it through and deploy successfully and it comes back up in some kind of big setting if i'm the team lead in that example it will be oh brian successfully fixed the problem and put the code out even though it was late friday thanks brian for working late and i'll say and i'll say you're welcome I will not acknowledge any of my team members. I will not unless unless there was a failure, and then it was a problem on, with one of my team members. Yeah. They screwed up. My scrum masters didn't tell anyone. My product owner was trying to push too hard. My team members were not competent enough developers. Unless it was a success, and then I succeed. Absolutely, it's classic, right? So if it's a success, then you you take a deeper breath, you know, puff out your chest, what right? a hero. and you say, yeah. Right, and if it's a failure, you just go, <laughs> oh, oh right? man, I, you go like this. So it's someone else's fault, oh, and boy. I think this is where you really turn to separate the wheat from the chaff. The those that are real leads will say, yeah, it was a failure. Yeah. Here's why, yeah. and they pretty much put their neck on the noose. But here's what I've seen over my twenty plus years in the business is. I've never seen that noose get tightened. Yeah. And that's because somebody higher up says, oh, okay, if, it, it's all about credibility. Mm -hmm. So if this lead is saying, yeah, this is why it happened, and I'm saying this is why it happened, it's not through a fault of somebody, I'm not throwing anybody on the bus, all right? This is why it happened. So leadership's more akin to say, okay, they may ask questions, mind you. They may say, what are you gonna do? Make sure it doesn't happen again, mm -hmm. right? Because you know we were really hopeful, we were expecting we're gonna get this, blah, blah, blah. Right? This is what I'm going to do. So you need to, as a lead, be prepared to answer that. But you're a protector, pretty much. And your team is absolutely because the attention, the lens, and the focus is not on them. It's mm -hmm. on you. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is a team lead, mm -hmm. as I would define one. <laughs> the flip side of that, as you pointed out you know, quite aptly, is a team lead that 
puffs up his chest. I call it peacocking, by mm-hmm. the way. I, I think is, that's yeah. a real behavior. Yeah, it's a real behavior. You know, they go, oh, yeah, that diploma was success, right? Didn't I do a good job, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if it failed, it's like, eh, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, no. Yeah. So I've worked for people like that. Mm-hmm. And here's what I found. The day when I quit, three other people quit. Mm-hmm. I quit and just basically just said, this is not what I stand yeah. for, yeah. right? And I don't want to work for you because this is this is not yeah, the leadership yeah, yeah. I expect. Yeah. And I walked, and I remember very well this day, three o'clock in the afternoon, that's when it happened. Yeah. It wasn't even on a Friday, midweek, boom, done. I think it might have been Tuesday. And uh, the same day, other people did the same thing. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. It, it was one of those things. Somebody took a step and everybody wanted to take right, one, yeah. but nobody wanted to yeah, like yeah. be the first. That's but but I, I think j- just to go back to that idea about as a team lead, you have certain responsibility. Mm-hmm. So that responsibility is twofold, right? One is what is bestowed upon you as a team lead. Well, what are you expected to do? That yeah. That's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is what about you as a person? Yeah. What are you willing to stand up for? Mm-hmm. Are you willing to be labeled as a lead, but you're really only going to just do what they're looking for yeah. and be a quote unquote, yes, man. I don't mean man as a like Yes, man. Yes, person, whatever. Right. Yeah, are, yeah. are you doing that just yeah. so that your neck is below that propeller? Yeah. Right? You know, it's like, well, that's the lawnmower. That's, that's definitely not the hero, <laughs> but that's the next thing on my list, which is the order taker, which is the, the one who, who doesn't stand up for anything. That That's that's the most typical manager that I can think of right there is the one who they don't stand for anything. They kind of like they just go with the flow. They do what they're told. You know, they don't really have any strong moral leanings one way or the other, you know? Right, so they're really not a lead, but but for a second, let's just, we'll go back to that in a second, right? Mm-hmm. So those people that are <laughs> those heroes, mm-hmm. for me, it's a really short ladder between hero and zero, right? <laughs> Seriously, because those people that are heroes one day, if, they, if they're heroes because they're they're peacocking, whatever, right? They're not going to be heroes for long because yeah. their team recognizes that behavior. That is a behavior that is seen. I, I remember this scene where somebody was feeding a bunch of ducks, mm-hmm. uh, you know, next to a pond. And, and so these th- there's like eight ducks. And there's a big duck that could see over the top of these other ducks. I'll make it short, I promise. So this person <laughs> comes up with, with some bread and they throw some bread down on the, on the lawn. And... This big duck could see this person approaching. They were the older duck, I'd say, more experienced maybe. And they could recognize a person coming toward them, throwing things, that means food. Yeah. So they were the first ones to just like rush over, right? They were panting, rush over, and they're starting to peck at this food that's on the, on the grass. Mm-hmm. And other people follow behavior, they see this, oh yeah. So they come, right? So, and so the next day, that person is just walking by. They're walking their dog as it happens. The dog was on the other side, not the side towards the, the birds. But yes, anyway, they're not feeding them. That's the point. And so the lead bird who was eager again sees the person arrive and they immediately go right up. It's yeah. that Pavlovian kind of response, right? They're, oh yeah, this must mean food. So they come up and there's no food. And what I found is this, that person immediately, when they saw there's no food, turned back and, and went back the other way. Yeah. But what did I see? I saw all these other birds that followed that lead bird, right, for yeah. want of a better expression. Yeah. We're talking about leads. Lead bird, right? They're hanging around. They're still waiting. They're still waiting. They're still waiting. And there's nothing, mm-hmm. right? And and the person who fed them the day before, they're gone. Long story short, here's, the expected behavior is already sewn into the heads of your yeah. followers yeah. and remember that because they will just do that it's mechanistic right mm-hmm. they're going to do that and so you have a responsibility to sow the right behavior mm-hmm. because today you're there tomorrow you're not right so if you're not there now some people just say well what do i care if i'm not there i don't care right and, and to me that speaks volumes about them as a character and as a person mm-hmm. if you're not there and you don't care about that You have a team, for God's sake, right? You're not flying solo. Yeah, so anyway, let's just go back to what we were talking about earlier. I just wanted to share that little story there. That was fine. I I love segues. This this is a podcast is usually all about segues. I don't see why this one should be any different. Especially ours, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've been listening to a lot of real esoteric podcasts recently about like ancient history and stuff like that. And they were talking about, I really wish I could remember so I can give credit properly, but I, I can't, so oh well, about the 
the idea of leadership in human society, like thousands and thousands of years, like 10,000 plus years ago, like years ago, like maybe whatever, 100,000 years? I don't know, a long time. I mean, unless unless you think the earth is only 6,000 years ago, then, you know, 6,000 years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're very inclusive. I have to cut that out. It's too crazy now. Humans are willing to give up the, the best the best food, the best pick, you know, the, the best uh, mate or whatever to, to the leader of the organization because it's the leader of the organization. When, when it comes time, it's the leader of the organization that's got to step out and fight the lion or fight the big cats or chase the snakes away or whatever. But when the leader of the group shirks that responsibility or is cowardly or whatever, then the group just kills that person. That basically, that should be the trade-off of these bad leaders. You know what I mean? Like this hero developer who who is doing this kind of behavior. <laughs> you know? I love that. Uh, so abdicating your responsibility, right? Has yeah. consequences, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, abdicating and your And sometimes they're life-threatening yeah. consequences. I love Th- that. That's exactly right. They should yeah. be life-threatening consequences. I mean, the, the individual that I was talking about before with the pu- engaging in the punishing behavior, he would do that to other team members as well. He would go off when we were refining something, for example. And uh, he was a hero developer, actually, now that I think about it. But when he would do this kind of stuff in front of the team and one person would stand up to him, he would do exactly what I would say. Oh, you're just finger pointing. You're just whatever. But if two people started taking him to task in front of the group, potentially a third part, he would back down 100% of the time. He would back down 100% of the time and he would not bring it up again. If the tribe started ganging up on him, he would turn tail as quick as possible, or get eliminated, right? Well, he, you know, he, he. I mean, that's that. That that's that. Y- yeah, you know, animalistic yeah, yeah, behavior. Yeah. Or, or he would come off of that team and, yeah. and stay off of it for a while and exactly. go, go on to something else or whatever. For yeah, intents and purposes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He would avoid. Off yeah, the picture. That's exactly right. He would go out of the picture basically. I think there's something to explore here. I just don't know how to. I, I yeah. So... I was involved in a code camp um, a, a few years ago, and uh, one of the things I noticed is this: we we're talking about hero developers. Mm-hmm. They they welcome everybody. You've never had any coding yeah. experience. That's fine. So, and you know, from there all the way onto like real expert mm-hmm. developers. So they break up into random pairs or groupings, and on the grouping that I was observing, I ha- I saw a person who had almost like. 20 plus years of coding experience is brilliant. Mm-hmm. And he was in a group of newbies. And the behavior I witnessed was completely contrary to what I was expecting. I was expecting him to say, this is how you do things, right? Yeah. It kind of take a leader role. And what he did is he stayed quiet. Mm. And so the other people were like, well, we don't know what to do. What should we do? And he just kept quiet and I'm thinking, say something, you have 30 years. I didn't say anything, I'm an observer. Yeah. So I was just like, okay, I'm just observing. So I'll speak with my eyes, you know. And I'm in the back of the room, so nobody could watch me, thankfully. But what happened after a short period of time is these newbies, they took a direction. They talked about it, and they said, well, let's try that. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing is they didn't have a leader appointed, even informally. They just said, we'll try this. If it doesn't yeah. work, we'll come back. Yeah. And that's when the expert in the room, that what I would have called a hero developer, spoke up. And here's what he said. He said, kudos to you for, you know, doing this. Here's what I suggest. Other people had some voices. Let's just make a list. Mm -hmm. And we'll try one alternative. That that doesn't work, right? We'll come back to the board, cross that off, try the next one. And I thought, wow, that is magnanimous of that person to say. But he knew what to do. He just, it must have taken all his effort to say, I'm not going to, you know, impinge upon the team my own views. To me, that is a tech lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's tough to do. I will it tell is. you. I, I Absolutely. promise you, especially when you were the domain, like, like that product I was talking about before where I was a domain expert and a technical expert, it's very difficult to stay out of the conversation. You have to, that's a learned skill. Yes. You know, I, I would say some people it comes more naturally or whatever, but that's a tough one to try to convince me that it comes natural to, to not, not natural. talk when people are talking about something that you're an expert at. I, I really am convinced that is not a natural skill. I think that's a developed skill. It's a learned skill, yeah, yeah. right? If it were natural, everybody would do it from the day one, right? From the ground up. Some people, We're not yeah. seeing that. Yeah, some people would. Yeah, and we're not seeing enough people do that. Yeah, so. yeah. That's, a, that's a good one. That's a good point out of what would be a good behavior. 
I want to cut back to our list. So, so the the order taker, the, like, wh- why the so the order taker and the person who has a lack of integrity, I they're sort of the same. The only reason I separate them is because the order taker basically does not have the ability to craft a vision and carry out a vision themselves. But basically, they can't think. They can only think tactically. They can't think strategically. Let me put it that way. If you have your roadmap level and then you have your user story level, they can only create and, and deal with user story items. They can they can never build a roadmap. And they can't think at that level. I don't know how to explain that one well because I've just observed some people who just cannot, they cannot elevate themselves up to that level of thinking in the organization for whatever reason. Maybe they're just not creative. I, I don't know what it is. So I'm not really accusing anybody of anything here. Yeah, absolutely. Here's what I'd, I'd like to. Kind I, of I could offer. accuse people if I. You could, <laughs> okay, but fine. that's a different podcast, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, so here's what I'd like to offer for that. Let's imagine that you're building a construction, mm-hmm. right? It's a home. Doesn't matter, office block. Doesn't matter what it is. So you have somebody who lays out the plan, the architect, right? Mm-hmm. Here's the plan. This is how the building will be constructed, yeah, yeah. and you have others that actually do the construction, they follow the plan. Do we really, can we really expect everybody who is following the plan to rise to the level of that surveyor architect, whatever you wanna call it. Mm -hmm. So in offering that metaphor, what I'm saying is some people's forte is in following the plan. Some people's forte is in crafting the plan. And it kind of harkens back to our military days, right? You know, you don't question the plan you're handed down, even though you have 50 million questions. You don't question it. You follow the orders. Yeah, but hang on, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna step in for a second because yeah, some, I had I had somebody when I was a consultant try to use that example on me, and I did not step over them because there was like 50 or 60 people in the room, and I was like, if I come down on this guy in his example now, I'm just gonna make him look real bad. But but basically, his example was exactly what you were saying, which is we shouldn't question leadership because you know they're they're telling us what to do and, and how to do it, and that's what they do in the military. They tell you how to do it, and then I, I wanted to tell him, actually, you are wrong. In the military, they are trained to know the difference between telling your small groups the objective. They do not dictate tactics to a small group. Absolutely. They they tell them what to do. Not they the wouldn't. How. They would never tell them, "Hey, go take this hill, and you're only allowed to use this weapon, and you're only allowed to fire it this way." You climb up and you're the only northwest allowed, ridge, and you're not only allowed any other way. To, you're only ra- allowed to use six bullets each. Like that would never happen. And the fact that you're not understanding means that, <laughs> in in that instance, I was like, the fact that you're not understanding means that you don't understand this type of thinking either. The most relevant thing I can bring this back to you, because it's very nebulous, bringing up this way, order taker, someone without vision, but I'm gonna give you an example, and let me see if it doesn't completely focus what I'm talking about. Yes, you have people that think up here at the roadmap level, you have here that think, uh, you know, up here who design, you know what I mean, the, the think, in terms of design, whipping things out of midair, very creative people. You have people that, that they just follow the orders and build exactly what you tell them to do. However, the role of product manager, especially product managers of small companies, they have to do both. They have to have the skill to be creative and engage in what are my customers exactly telling me what to do? Okay, I'm gonna ignore exactly what they're telling me to do because it sounds like they want me really to build this. And then I'm going to get one of my teams and brainstorm of exactly how we're going to meet those objectives and not do exactly what the customer says. And we're going to build this this way. And basically, I'm taking their suggestions and then I'm crafting my own vision from that. And then we're going to achieve the the time. Like I've met more product owners that will listen to what the customer wants and then they'll do exactly what the customer wants because they don't have the ability to craft their own vision. So they're order takers, they're, they're, they're what are they called? Feature factories. Yes. They're called, they're feature factories. It's like, they, it's so often there's an industry, there's an agile term for it, right? Uh, or a software development term for it, but that's what it really means. They're, they're and I, mean, I would argue that a product manager is also like a team lead level type of person. They're, they're like a leadership level type mm-hmm. of person. Maybe you can separate the product owner part, the tactical part out of it and say they're with the teams. To, to do two different de- designations. But what I'm trying to say is, that's a real example of what I'm talking about, is the person who, they just cannot create a vision for themselves. Now, I might be being unfair. 
I'm monologuing, so I'm going back to myself. I might be being unfair because I have also met managers, team leads, whatever, that routinely work 60 hours plus every week. They work on weekends at least a day. They usually work at night. You see them on at night from ping them. Hey, you okay? You still working? Blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? We all know these people, in the field, especially developers, right? They're the worst for it in my, in my experience. And they're just, they don't have great time management skills. That's why they're order takers. They just, the, the first in, first out. Highest paid person in the room screaming gets their orders service first. Basically, the, what I was using before is like the, my manager came in and was like, just do this this one time for this one person, make them go away. That type of thing. That's, that all falls into this category for me of they're just so overwhelmed. They just want things to go away. That and the product manager who just, they're too busy to create a vision for themselves, that kind of stuff. Like, or maybe they're just not creative people, just just by right of not being creative people. That's not a, that's not a knock, no. you know. They, they, but all those people to me fall into this category. So I, I I agree. I just wanted to add a little more color to that. While I agree that not everybody is going to be quote unquote creative, right? <laughs> yeah. Some product owners are just complying and 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 kind of following the business sure some on the other hand you can call them mavericks if you like some of these are trend breakers most are kind of like trend followers mm -hmm. some of those people will say we're not going to listen to what the customers are asking for right we think they may like x y yeah. whatever yeah, yeah these are disruptors they're the ones that are setting the trend yeah that's a risky proposition. Yeah. Okay. But they're taking the risk. Yeah. You're going to find, if, if you look at the population, that's a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing that we have history. So we look back and say, of those people, how did they fare? Yeah. And, and what I found, I looked into this, I think it was somewhere around last year. What I found is this of those, the small percentage that are these people that are, I call them mavericks, but take, Pick your metaphor. They're the ones that are disruptors, right? They're saying, well, the customer is saying this, but what we really believe is they might really love this. They yeah. might like what they're yeah. saying, but yeah. they might love this. Yeah. I found those people falling into two camps. I found X percent, I'm deliberately keeping this vague for now, X percent who really succeed and they set the market trend and everybody else follows mm -hmm. a little while later, but they follow. They, mm -hmm. These are the real kind of leaders in the market space, right? The thought leaders. And I found Y percent that tried it and failed, right? These are like those little little ducklings that try and leap over the edge of the pavement, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, that's the footpath, whatever, the sidewalk. And they fail and they fail and they fail and eventually they may get over. But by that time, the the mother ducks moved on and these people are now scrambling to keep up. <laughs> so that, so I've, I found both of those. Now, the reason why I kept it vague is this. I think it's contextual. I think it's industry specific. If you look at some industries, I'll point to one, right? So one industry that I'll point to is this whole Bitcoin world. Mm -hmm. That and the, this whole, this whole NSF. Look it up if you're not sure what NSF is. <laughs> but yeah, so that that is an, quote unquote, new area. And you're going to find fewer people willing to roll up their sleeves and say, I'm going to take a dive in, right? Other people are like, hey, I don't know what that means, but I'm gonna stay with what I'm comfortable with, mm -hmm. right? And that's okay. That will still pay off for you, maybe, let's hope. Yeah. But the margins will be different. We know who the mavericks are in our industry, right? And we know who those people that are playing safe are. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's a right and a wrong. I, I think, you know, going back full circle as a tech lead, one of your roles is to have your vision and say, this is an area for my own team at this point in time with what I'm charged to do, I can take this direction. Mm -hmm. You know, I love NS, you know, this, this whole non fungible or right. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I love and, uh, NFTs. But, NFTs. But, yeah, but, that's, but what, I'm not that's gonna, what I thought you meant when you said I was like, yeah, NFT, yeah, yeah. he's talking about NFTs. NFTs yeah. is what, yeah, I don't know what I said, but I meant NFTs. But anyway, so not everybody is going to be a risk taker in that sense. Sure. Most people are going to go, my team is here. I can lead them, but I can't really pull them in a direction yeah. completely contrary yeah. to where they need to be, yeah. even though that's what they may need. Yeah. Right. Uh, and leaders 
where they're sold can see this behavior. Mm -hmm. Those are smart leaders. They can see that and say, oh, well, I see you're, you're shepherding your team this way. Yeah. I really think if you need to, feel free, and they have your back. That doesn't happen very often, folks, yeah, right? Yeah. But it needs to in our in any industry. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is not commonplace. You you know what I was gonna say? Like I, I don't I want to run through the rest of these. Yeah, yeah. Because my like I I already have my summary. I I'm already thinking of what my summary is. My, my summary of this is the situation that I was a lead in, where I had the manager who was the manager was over me, and the manager kind of did stuff. And manager kind of led initiatives and I led initiatives and we kind of were both over the same team. It shouldn't really be like that. The manager should be here and then the the leads should be here, but then the individual teams and the resources on those teams should go up to leads. And then in that model, in that distributed model, the lead should be judged just like the manager, but only for those teams under the segment. I don't think a lead should be judged like a team member should be judged. Absolutely. I couldn't I, I, agree more. I, I, I mean, you could say occasionally, I'm going to pull a lead to do onesie, twosie kind of tasks or whatever, but they should be considered so competent that why would you even try to judge them by something that they're already an expert in? You really should be judging them based off of how well they do the leadership job with just the smaller subset of people under them. And even in a distributed team, that's fine, they're, but they're still responsible for the people under their charge. Like if you're a QA team lead and you support five different development teams that each only have one QA member, you're still supporting five teams. Yes. You're still supporting five teams, five people. Uh, and maybe you might rock star in and out of those teams as they have problems and need your help to kind of get them over whatever. But you should be judged on how well you lead those people through those situations, not based on like, I don't know, team level metrics and stuff like that. That's kind of where I'm going at the end of this. So I'd like, to, I'd like to cut this section and yeah, move yeah, it to yeah. the end. Let's do that. <laughs> so no, I, I fully agree because if you're not doing that, then guess what? Your team lead is going to behave just like the people they're leading. That's what I'm saying. Because you're, that, behaving, it, it, you're it, behaving like that, right? Yeah, you're that's saying. what I'm saying. In, in my situation is I, I was a pseudo team member on initiatives occasionally, but then I'd bounce in and out of projects. And so I was kind of all over the place just putting out fires. Yeah. There was really not a great way to track my metrics. If I was just tracked on whatever you would track a department manager on, then it would have been a lot easier to say, are you doing a good job? You're not doing a good job. Because if you're judging a manager, you should judge a team lead. You really should, that really is, this really is a summary. I'm gonna have to move this whole section. If you're judging a, I might not, now that I've made a big <laughs> deal about it, I might just leave it right where it is. Cause I do that. I also like when people catch me doing that. They're like, hey, you said you, you would said move you the would. section. You didn't do anything. That's right, I didn't. You really should just be judged by how well of a, leader slash manager you are even though those pieces of management have been delegated to you you really should be judged how well of a leader slash manager you are because i would assume that at some point you're going to want to move up to a manager at some point and there should be a track record of you're a good manager in order to move you up rather than i'm a good programmer so now i'm some sort of scaled programmer and then I'm gonna be the department lead of all the programmers and and nowhere along the line have I earned or learned, ooh, earned or learned, learned, or learned. any managerial slash leadership experience in, in any, because I've never been judged on my managerial slash leadership talent. And like, listen, to, in my defense, in that instance, I don't know why I'm <laughs> accusing myself, <laughs> that's a new one, <laughs> uh, I've never been taught any of that stuff. I've never had to go out and learn any of that stuff because it's not been what the I've been judged by. My company's never gone out and said, Brian, if you want your next promotion, you've got to go out and learn how to be a better communicator and learn how not to be punishing people all the time and learn how not to be, you know, blaming, doing a blame game thing, stuff like that, you know. Dude, absolutely. I was going to go there. So if you're not judging leaders or tech leads by what they're leading, right? I call them team leads. Team it could leads, be, tech, yeah. Matter. Team leads, tech leads, QA leads, yeah, whatever. Could be any, right? any leads. If you're not judging them by their leading kind of prowess, if you will, right? What's gonna happen is they will not grow. They're gonna go back to the basics. Right. And so your organization as a whole doesn't really become what I call a learning organization. Yeah, right. and I don't call it that. Right. I like that term. It's Peter Senge's term. Goes back like, I don't know, 40 years, whatever, mm -hmm. 30 years at least. But anyway, that 
if you're a learning organization, you're going to say your your team leads will grow into the kinds of roles that you mentioned just now, instead of just looking looking at how you're judging them. Yeah. yeah. And so this goes all the way into you know performance, how you're judging performance, reward, and all of that, right? And so we can have a different segment yeah. on that, the reward I, systems and how people are, you know. I, I don't know if we need to. It's, 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 if you put somebody in a team lead role, but you still evaluate them like they were a team member. You'll they, get what you, they, what you they, measure. Yeah, they already should have excelled in that realm. So like, how much are they going to backslide? Uh, they already should have excelled in that realm to get to a point where they're now the lead. So why would you keep evaluating on something that they're already great at? I, yeah, I, I, I don't the know. only the only answer I have to that that's a great question, by the way. The only answer I have to that is lots of organizations don't have an answer to that because they have <laughs> right, yeah, they right. have role based evaluations. Right, right, yeah. You know, we know yeah. what a developer should be doing. That's how we evaluate right. a lead. It's just a developer, right? Yeah. yeah so yeah. that that's the problem right there. It's that mindset that mm -hmm. needs to shift. Yeah. So I talked about the order taker and the lack of vision. We kind of harped on that quite, quite, yeah. quite enough. My favorite one out of this list is the micromanager. The micromanager. It sounds like a manager who's tiny. Yeah, it does. They got, they got, they a went, little manager. They went into the wash and they got put on the wrong, shrunk. The wrong water setting. And yeah, I uh, shrunk the manager. Yeah, they're a micromanager. Yeah. They're a micromanager. They, they need to get down into those. They need to manage all those little micro details. They got to micromanage. I can make it sound like a good thing. Right? So I have this thing that I say, which is if you want to delegate properly, you have to uh, delegate both the responsibility and the accountability. Responsibility, of course, is actually doing the job. And the accountability is people come to you to communicate about the job, to say, hey, where is this at? Go ask home. I delegated the task to him. Go ask him. So that that sounds like a bad thing. Like I have worked for some managers where if I told them that, they'd be like, how come you don't know? How come you don't know where it is? What do you, well, it's because it's this person's task now. Go ask them how it's going. But the, the thing that you get when you when you say that is, if you are now accountable for a task, you're accountable for the good and the bad. Yes. So when, when you think of being like, we went back with the hero developer, you're now accountable, but only when it's bad. I'm accountable when it's good. Meaning accountable, see, accountable gets a bad rap because it's a dirty word sometimes. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to hold you accountable, that kind of thing. But it's it's just not accountable. It's It's... Who do I communicate with about this work? Which also means who gets to say when the work is done, who gets to claim accomplishment when the work is completed. You know, that that's all part of accountability to me. So, yeah, it's a couple of different places I'm gonna unpack that with. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So first of all <laughs> first of all, responsibility without accountability is a recipe for failure. Oh yeah. Because you're instilling a culture that is becoming a blame culture. Sure. You're, you're saying you're accountable, but we're not going to empower you to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a blame game. And two things are going to happen. First of all, near-term failure. So as an organization, you're going to suffer. Uh, near to medium term, you're going to lose some good people. That's what's going to happen because people will see that and they're going to just gravitate away from that culture, which is kind of a, a hostile culture to begin with. The second thing yeah. I want to say is this about this this whole thing is there's two levels to this. So when people are holding you responsible, as an individual, you have a say in this. Mm -hmm. You don't just say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, right? You've got to say to yourself, okay, I'm being asked to do something. Can I do this? Am I, and am I equipped to do this, right? Do I yeah. need more training? Yeah. Do I have the authority I need, et cetera, et cetera. You ask all those questions. And if any of the answers are no, and you still don't say anything, yeah, start packing up your desk mm -hmm. because you are going to be blamed for when you fail. Not if you fail, you will fail because you've answered your own questions. You're saying no. So when you say no to any of those questions, I urge people to just basically grow backbone and say, I'll do what you're asking me to do. However, help me help you. Mm -hmm. Here's what I need. And if I don't have that, I cannot succeed. I hope you see that, mm -hmm. Mr. Leader, Miss Leader, right? And so if you do that, what you're doing is you're, you're really making it transparent that your needs to fulfill a certain ask are based on the ask itself. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not coming from me to my leader saying, I need this, or I need the latest Mac computer, whatever. 
No, I need this because you're asking me to do something. Right. And in order to fulfill that, I need this. I need you to understand if I don't have this, you will not have what you're asking me to deliver. Yeah. Right. And therefore, this might be implicit, but I, I urge my team members to make it very explicit. Right. Therefore, it is not on me. Let me ask you a question of, of, of if you consider this micromanaging. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to hit you on. I'm going to hit you with a, uh, a typical project manager statement and see if you consider it micromanaging. Okay. Oh, I need you to do task X, Y, Z. Do you think you can get that done by Wednesday? Awesome question. I love that question. So, first of all, is that micromanaging? A, no, 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 no. So, as a recovering project manager, here's what I and I used to be. I, I admit it fully. I used to be a project manager that did that. Those are the best because project my, managers, by the way. My my job Air was quotes. to get it done. Yeah. So I would always say, "Can it be done by this date?" Right. Right. But yeah. I didn't say it that way. I just said, "Can you get it done by this date?" Right. Huge difference between those two questions, right there. Right. So is it micromanaging? Yeah, you're micromanaging one person at a time. Right. Is what you're doing. I would much rather reframe that to say, we need to get it done by this date. Mm -hmm. What will it take for us to be able to do that? Yeah. Now, there's a we and an us in here. There's no I and you, right? Although I'm not doing any work. What I'm really doing is opening the door for the person that I'm asking this to to say, in order for me to do this, mm -hmm. here's what I need. I want to hear that yeah. because if I don't enable that, he or she cannot deliver that. And then collectively you all fail, right? So yes, it is micromanaging is the short answer to your question. It is. You might not see it as that, but it is. It is I, micromanaging because you're, you are actually saying, I need you to get it done by this date. Yeah. Your words may not be as strong as that. You may say, it needs to be done by this date. You're already telling me the date. If you think you know it can be done by this date, that's knowledge that you have based on something. And I, as a person who's being told this, mm -hmm. I posit that you've never done this. You're just telling me that it can be done. Mm -hmm. So what basis do you have for that? And well, I need to be yeah, able yeah. to push back and say, no, it what, cannot be done by that what date. About, Here's why. What about in a refinement? You have your development team lead in the room and your developers, your tester and everyone who's like, we think this story is an eight. And the development team leads like, no, what are you talking about? This is a two. You guys can get it done in about a day. It should be a two. Okay, fine. It's a two. Is that micromanagement? Absolutely. It is overt micromanagement in that case because... You, you've just overruled the sentiment of the team and said, oh, it should be able to be done. We're triggering well, left and right today. Uh, you know, when I was a scrum master, when this happens, right I now. know, right? <laughs> feel free to keep, right? Don't, don't hit your comments, screens, though. Comments. Yeah, please put comments in. When I was a scrum master on teams like that, I, here's what I would say to the person who's trying to anchor the situation is say, if you really believe it can be done in, you know, it's a two, then... Perhaps you can deliver that because I don't think that's true for the rest of the team. Yeah. Right? So if you think it's a two, go ahead. Be my guest. Knock yourself out. Mm -hmm. But don't speak for the team. Mm -hmm. Right? And when this behavior precipitates time and again, you kind of get ahead of that a bit. Yeah. Not as a scrum master maybe, but I did do that. I would reach out to that person and say, really valuable to hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I would urge you to keep your mic on mute <laughs> until everybody else has cast their vote. Yeah. And then you can say, because now you'll yeah, see yeah. what your team is really feeling. Okay, how about that? Can we work with that? Yeah. Let's try that as an experiment. Yeah, yeah. That, like you might have just hit on something that we like, kind of combined with the last podcast but the way that we did is like uh, when you're doing your estimations, well, first of all, I, I don't like your tech leads really shouldn't be in the part of estimation but unless they're actually part of the development team on the development team. That's a whole different thing. But if they are, for whatever reason, if they want to give their comment, they should give their comment after the team has decided like what the number is. You know? I, I welcome their comments, but like you said, after, because they can serve as guardrails. They may yeah. have seen a similar situation right. before, right. right? And so if the team is in a certain spot, they could say, well, have you considered this, this, and this? I, I've done exactly what you just said. I've done with, with development leads before. I was like, oh, if you think it's a two for you and it's a five for the team, why don't you knock it out in an afternoon and take it off the team's plate and you'll help this team out, you know, big time. And yeah. sometimes they're like, oh, challenge accepted, sure. I'll do it. Sure, and that's great. It's good for the team. How, you know, before that happens, yeah. right, we would say, okay, 
if you think it's a two, why it's a two, right? right. If you think it's a five, why is it right. a five? Let's just have a little yeah. dialogue about that. I, I, I mean, I, I, you know. I, I I should I should clarify as well because it's it's not fair to present one side of that. I've also had a discussion where the uh, technical lead or development lead, sp- the specific instance I'm thinking about is, was a development lead, more like a director of development in that ex- in example. He was like, I think it's a two, not whatever eight, five, whatever it was that the team says, and it was because he was like, you guys need to reuse the component that's here that maybe none of the team was familiar with because maybe they didn't write it or whatever. And he's like, it's the components there. All the libraries that we have are already in the code. They're already in. Uh, you can use them. They do exactly what we want to do. It should be a simple reuse, you know, reuse an object type of situation. Nobody on the team knew that because because of different reasons, right? Maybe they weren't, right. you know, didn't didn't know that part of the code or whatever. But once he sat down and explained it after we broke or whatever, once he sat down and explained it, everyone was on board after that. And and, and a five or an eight really did become a two. You know? Absolutely. That, that's a great example. Yeah. I, I think that's a team lead being a team lead. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I've seen another example. Well, well he, he had to have a mentoring session separate with sure. those developers after that. Yep. And and yes, that, that was a good as example of when a good team lead is a good team lead. Yeah. yeah. And I have another example, which is a slightly different kind of example. Mm-hmm. So in my example, the team estimated an item as a three, right? Yeah. And I had coached team lead lead to not actually say anything the tech lead right until the end yeah and they say well actually i think it's a five and i thought that's interesting why is that i may have the numbers wrong it doesn't really matter the point is he estimated higher right yeah and so when asked why he said we have have you considered the fact that this is client facing customer facing right mm-hmm. and we have to make sure we take into account accessibility mm. right so things like color schemes and being able to cater for the visually challenged, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. And the team hadn't considered that. Not their fault, this right. hadn't. They looked at just the dev items at hand. Sure. So he was able to relay his experience, mm. which is what a team lead should be able to do, yeah. and say, this is okay to develop, but considering the fact that it has to be accessibility compliant, yeah whatever that standard is, W3, whatever, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he said, based on that, I think it's this high, you know, this higher number. Right, yeah. And everybody agreed, and it turned out that he was right. Mm. So I've seen it go the other way too, but the thing is, again, it's an example of a tech lead being a lead, mm-hmm. right? They're leading the team. Yeah. So I, I think these are great examples of how to lead a team, right? Don't anchor them, right? Offer your expertise. Here's yeah. what I've seen work. And I, I think you're really setting an example yeah, with your yeah. team. That's awesome. Yeah. The last category on here is something we'll cruise through in 30 seconds because it's it's pretty much apparent. Like the, the person who has a problem with honesty and or backbiting. Uh, so, so backbiting would be the example of like behind your back, they spread rumors about you, that kind of stuff. If you encounter a person like this who's in a lead position, I'm going to go back to one of our earlier prognosis and say uh, there's nothing you can do about someone these kind of like this kind of unprofessional type of behavior. Like if someone if someone has the inability to be a little I'll just call them a liar. If someone's just a liar, that's just a defect of their personality. They cannot tell the truth. They bend the truth to make themselves feel better or look better or maybe they just can't stomach telling the truth. I really don't know why someone would, there's just there's some unprofessional behaviors that you just should not put up with. Absolutely. Th- this is one of them, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've all come across people that are I'll just say being economical with the truth, yeah. right? These are people that tend to be glory seekers. Uh, they don't share overtly and and at the last minute they come in and they almost pip you at the, you know, at the finishing tape so to yeah. speak, right? These yeah. people are looking to win for themselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so people like that, if they are in a leadership position like a lead, mm-hmm. right? First things first. In your role as you know, an agile coach, scrum master, or you can actually have a conversation with them and say, "Do you realize you're doing this?" Yeah, yeah. And if they say they don't care, whatever, that's the time when you just either give up, which I don't like to do, or, or you go, you know, above that and say, "This person is not a su- yeah. suitable fit." I would expect they would deny. I mean, if that's their they personality could. type, they're just going to be like, "This, no, I'm not doing that. You don't know what you're talking about." That kind of, you know, I mean, then yeah. while before, you know, they'll try to get ahead of you and uh, start rumor mongering before you throw out throw, throw out basically the, the people that i've dealt with like this will try to throw out so many lies that the like management won't even try to wade through it they'll be like look 
you, Ohm, and you, Brian, obviously have a problem with each other, and you guys just keep it between you. And I don't want to hear about it again. That that's that's the bad management way I've seen of dealing with people like that. People like this, they just rot a whole organization. Whatever whatever wing department portion. I'm spitting all over the place of the organization that they're in. They just rot it out. So that's what I'm saying is like you need to get as far if there's a room and they're in one corner, you need to go find the opposite corner of that room if possible or just escape the room if possible. I was going to say you need to be in a different building. Close the door and screw it shut because that person's influence will spread. It's you you have to stay away from people like that. That's I mean, honestly I don't have any more to add on this no, subject. No, yeah, I think you're right. So you know ultimately it comes down to that. But I think as a as a person who is just leaving that revolving door because you know if you're a consultant mm-hmm. that's what happens. Your credibility is at stake. So one of the things you need to do is to leave that legacy behind and say here's what I think because you know what's going to happen, right? right? At some point later you know, T plus X. Well, at some point later, you're going to find that leadership will see that this person is really the issue because oh, yeah. they're going to keep doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were never the issue, yeah. but you were the one because you're a consultant. Yeah. Uh, you're always at that revolving door. You keep yeah. going around and around. So you're out, but they will recognize that and they'll say, ah, mm-hmm. Brian said that this might be the case. Mm-hmm. This is right. So Brian may get a call to come back. So that's the thing. I think ultimately you need to really be true to yourself and and just leave the right kind of legacy for yourself yeah, yeah. that's that serves you well in the well long there's run. i mean there but i could go back to my previous example where i'm like you know when you see something like this happening document it you know i mean be the person to raise your hand and if 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 you get walked out because their management is not willing to deal with the, the i mean the backbiting behavior rumor spreading behavior stuff like that i've dealt with a lot of this that's just really, really unprofessional, and that management and HR really should have dealt with it as soon as they see it. I almost don't even want to bring this up because it's, uh, it's so far down a rabbit hole. I don't want it, it, it. This is the same category to me as like uh, sexual harassment kind of stuff. Management should be jumping all over that as soon as they see it. But we've all heard stories about organizations where the management just kind of sits on it. They kind of hope it goes well. It's just this one person, the person who is accusing quits the company because they don't feel uncomfortable anymore and then the problem goes away when that person quits like this is the same type of thing and and yes i understand what you're saying of maybe in the future the company will realize a problem and get rid of the maybe get rid of the manager or the whole wing or whatever that was that had the issues or whatever but honestly like i don't know why you would deal with that just just turn your back on that and never look back yeah, you professional know. harassment is uh, a real thing. Take, take, I, take I the admit. chance of being turned into a pile of salt. <laughs> Do not look back in that situation. Yeah, that, that, absolutely. Look, professional harassment, is, as I like to call that, right, is a real thing. Yeah. Absolutely. But I'm also a believer, you know, never burn your bridges, right? I mean, your legacy is what it is. So, yeah, you may never go back to that client. Mm-hmm. That's your prerogative. That's okay. And, and in all likelihood, to be honest, those would be the footsteps I would follow, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, this is a story, right? And it's a small industry. I, oh, I yeah. would not burn my bridges. That's I would true. just say, that's true. I've done my duty and I've right. told you this. And right. if you don't want to listen, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Well, I like to end this on a downer. Downer. This, this is the, it's a Debbie downer. This is a great downer to end on. With apologies to everybody yeah. called Debbie. This is the, the lowest of the low point. I have more, I have more stuff and we could keep going, but I think I'm kind of done with this one. Kind of this one. I mean, there, there was a lot of behaviors that if you see these red flags, you've got bad actors. I kind of was taking this from a team perspective. Like if you're stuck on the team or you, or if you're a peer lead to these other people, kind of wasn't taking it from a perspective of what if I was a scrum master observing this? Sure. Or if I was an agile coach observing this like from the outside. If you're an agile coach, you're kind of on a peer level with the team leads. So it's kind of like you're the person to kind of make the make the first move to say hey you know take take that person off one-on-one to say hey I've, I've noticed you're engaging in these type of behaviors or you know kind of talk about it with maybe talk about it with their manager you know hey I, I on on this date and this date and this date I mean you have to be on the spot with documentation right which I recommend for anybody going through any of these is like write down what is happening um, it's all about data yeah 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 and if I was an agile coach I would have some documentation of hey I was in this meeting I observed your person doing this. I observed them doing this. Like they seem to have some problems with some punishing behavior. 
you might want to talk to him. Might be, you know, if you want to keep him on the team, maybe list some things that you see as valuable about that person to kind of cushion the blow. There's ways to, to present these things sure. when you go into someone's manager to kind of seek corrective action. Uh, again, there are some things that are just completely out of line that you should just, you know, write your angry tweets to HR so they can write put it in their record because there's only so many of those that you can collect until it's like you yeah. know too many speeding tickets and you can't drive anymore that kind of situation absolutely couldn't agree more Woo, it's more that of a downer a great like, session oh man we went long on this one I think oh, we did well alright Agile Podcast questions at Gmail if you have uh, uh, things anyway uh, we're gonna keep on uh, being uh, hero uh, podcasters and you guys keep on being hero listeners and uh, yeah, let us know what you think and topics that you like us to discuss yeah down below yeah topics I like topics you topics like topics are good. yeah topics are good alright 